Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another video. Thank you for taking the time to join me on this very bright and sunny morning. Uh, it's beautiful, the birds are singing and I'm really just loving being out, hanging out with you guys. Um, so we're, right now we are in the in lockdown under COVID-19, a situation. I've just come out to the fields behind our house and uh, I thought, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about different content I can put out into the world. I want to stay sensitive to everybody's experience um, with what's going on at the moment. It's, it's a difficult and challenging time. Uh, and I thought, what better opportunity than to make a video I've been wanting to make for six years. Uh, yes, six years. And I'm talking about Kilimanjaro. And that's what I want to do today is to talk about my experience climbing Kilimanjaro in 2014. So I was 18 years old. I was just out of college by literally a week and a half, I think it was. Um, and uh, to just explain why I went, what happened, um, what it meant to me, how I grew for the experience and how it's forged me into who I am today and potentially uh, the ties I have with the mountain and my inevitable inevitable return someday. <laughs> uh, so it's just an opportunity for me to share some of the footage uh, which I obviously own and uh, I've not really known what to do with because we produced a documentary and more on that later. Uh, it's so much footage, it's so messy because everything went wrong uh, but right at the same time. So let's just have a chat today. Um, right, so Kilimanjaro. For those of you guys who don't know, it's the highest uh, freestanding mountain in the world. It's the highest mountain in Africa. So it's in Tanzania, um, so Eastern Africa. And uh, I went there, as I say, 2014, and I was 18 years old, so just out of college, uh, to climb this mountain. So this was my first sort of time doing anything on my own, first time overseas, first time flying myself, first long haul flight, um, <laughs> first proper documentary filmmaking experience. Uh, and so I say that because basically I was climbing with a team of four, well, three other uh, people. So there was a chap called Ian Singleton, who is a, an orangutan conservationist based over in Borneo in Indonesia, helps to uh, raise awareness about palm oil and to look after the orangutans and the environment over there. Big advocate for that movement, um, sort of top guy in the field. Um, really helping to make a difference over over there. Uh, there was Ian Redmond, who's well known for his work in Africa, uh, monitoring elephants, um, another African species, again conservationist, making a big difference there, uh, working with the, the likes of, well, just, just within the whole conservation field, these are some of the top, top chaps uh, out there. And then there's uh, Dr. Andy Steele. So he owns, owns the Plant a Tree Today Foundation. Um, and uh, he was the guy who sort of kicked it all off. So I was climbing with those. I'd never met them before, or with them. I'd never met them before. Um, <laughs> and I'd, I don't even quite remember how we got connected. I think it was because I had connected with Ian Singleton, <laughs> Ian S and Ian R, two different Ians, um, the orangutan conservationist, because I was very passionate about palm oil. Um, when I was 13, I spoke in the European Parliament about uh, palm oil production and how, uh, you know, labeling palm oil in cosmetics and food products would give consumers the choice to buy that or not, to boycott palm oil, palm oil or not. Um, now the issue of palm oil, just to give you a quick rundown, uh, we'll go back to Killy in a minute, is uh, it's usually, you know, planted in a monoculture, so a single um, tree for thousands, like just thousands of acres of this stuff, cutting down, slash and burn the rainforest, no respect to indigenous people, no respect to the wildlife, often um, allows entry to illegal loggers as well, and to um, wildlife poachers. Basically, it's all a bit of a mess. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, basically the outcome of that um, speech and conference that we did in the European Parliament a year or two later, uh, they finally made it legal, um, like law, so that, uh, especially here in the UK, palm oil has to be labelled. So if you look, uh, next time you go shopping, I don't know, for, for anything that's got a few ingredients in, it'll probably say vegetable oils, slash vegetable fats, bracket, I don't know, like oil, um, olive, palm, or something like that. And if you can see palm oil, then uh, if it doesn't say it's sustainable palm oil, if it's not round table of sustainable palm oil certified, then it's probably gonna be, it's likely going to be contributing to a lot of damage um, to, to the ecosystems um, over in sort of Indonesia and Borneo. And, and palm oil originated in Western Africa as well. So it sort of moved and shifted. But uh, so yeah, Ian works in that field. I was very passionate about that subject, doing a lot of speaking about it. Set up World Orangutan Day, which features every year in August. And um, I think we connected through that. And he was like, why don't you come and film our climb up Kilimanjaro? So that's how I got, uh, 
I got involved in that, which was super cool. And we had like one or two phone calls um, before the expedition, but really like I didn't have a freaking clue what I was doing. <laughs> um, I didn't really have the kit. Uh, I was still sort of new to, to getting into the outdoor world. And of course, you know, you hit Kilimanjaro at, 5,895 meters above sea level and you know you're getting into altitude sickness zone uh, you're getting into pretty cold weather zone um, and uh, it's just a whole new experience for me which I was super pumped about uh, nothing in me doubted that this was the right thing for me to do so finished college finished my A-levels um, then next thing I know I am at Heathrow Airport uh, meeting Ian Redmond for the first time who is a legend of a chap um, such a gentle humble person so thoughtful and considerate and he actually be became nicknamed Uncle Ian on the trip because uh, I struggled a lot with altitude and more on that later um, but uh, you know <laughs> we then we chatted and connected uh, flew out to Nairobi which was still in the throes of uh, being built up um, after it burnt down uh, and then we flew across to Kilimanjaro in, uh, airport and then onto Arusha uh, which was where we were picked up the next day for our for our trip so I met the rest of the team when we were in Arusha uh, so the reason why we were going out there was to make a film about global climate change and how climate change uh, has and is impacting the mountains glaciers so in the last 20 years um, or 25 years now um, you know more than nearly 30 percent of the mountains glaciers have disappeared um, just gone irreplaceably and we wanted to, to look at how that was affecting um, you know the, the local people the endemic wildlife so the wildlife native to, to Kilimanjaro to the tourism industry and basically to to Africa as a whole uh, because you know K Kilimanjaro is a big sort of climate weather climate for all the plains around Tanzania and, and Kenya um, so we wanted to sort of explore that and see what wildlife we can see talk to some of the locals talk to the guides and, and find out a little bit more as we went along uh, now I know a lot of people are going to jump straight away on well if you're talking about climate change you shouldn't have flown out there and that always comes up and that really um, it bothers me a lot because I think you're missing the point like I 100% understand that flying is not good for the planet of course it produces a lot of carbon emissions and actually the international panel for climate change suggests that in order to support ongoing sustainability we shouldn't exceed 2.3 tons of carbon um, per person per year currently um, in europe it's an average of 10 tons per carbon that we're putting out into the atmosphere and uh, about a third of those emissions are caused by flying uh, the other big in, um, sort of contributor to carbon into the atmosphere is is the agriculture industry. Uh, about 15% actually of all emissions, global emissions um, that go up into the into the atmosphere um, are from the agriculture industry. Where about whereas about two to five percent are from the from flying. Uh, but of course, for us as individuals, when we're looking at our impact, absolutely by cutting down on our flying, uh, we can make a huge difference or huge dent in the amount of carbon we're putting out into the atmosphere. The other thing as well is um, I just feel like, yes, like we are in the 21st century and essentially if we didn't fly, you know, we would have had to spend like a month or so trying to figure out how to get to to Kilimanjaro. And um, I, ju I just like, yes, you can absolutely boycott doing something. And I think co since 2014, conversation around flying and the impact it has has grown. And I think that's fantastic. And I'm certainly an, a, a very, very conscious flyer uh, I will always do carbon offsetting schemes um, so essentially what I'm saying is just please don't be quick to judge you know we're out there trying to tell a story and to to, um, to bring some some understanding and shed some light into the situation and, and in the 21st century that did that did mean flying but we were very very careful and considerate with what that actually meant you know those guys those three chaps are world-renowned conservationists if they're getting on a plane then they're clearly doing something <laughs> to to uh, mitigate the emissions that are going out there. Um, and I think as well, I think people need to be very careful uh, when they do quickly jump on the bandwagon and start to judge because unless you, one, is living a perfect life, I don't think anybody can comment on what anybody else is doing. I do everything that I can. I'm plant-based, um, <clears throat> X, Y, and Z. I'm not here to boast or give my ego a bit of a kick like or even to defend myself I just really really want to put that out there to explain what we were doing and um, and why we flew so yes we flew out to Nairobi then to Kilimanjaro airport Kilimanjaro airport was the cutest place I've ever been uh, it was so cool just like <laughs> just like all wooden inside and everyone was so friendly um, there was a little bit of 
kerfuffle around the yellow fever jabs and things. Um, I also didn't realise I was supposed to be taking malaria tablets because in Arusha there, there is uh, the possibility of getting malaria, but more on that story later. Uh, so yes, we get to Arusha, we have our briefing, we meet our, um, our, our guide, uh, so Me Mexon, who, uh, who basically guided us, we have Mexon and Ruben, um, and they took us up, up the mountain, which was super cool. Um, and basically, yeah, the next morning we woke up, um, bit of chaos trying to get the, the lift and that took us to the start of the walk. So we went along these rickety roads on this big old bus with uh, porters. So porters um, are, are commonly used across a lot of the mountain places where you know, you're gonna be on the mountain for an extended period of time and you need supplies and equipment. And what I love is there's the, I think it's the International Porter Association or something. So um, Kilimanjaro was, is within Kilimanjaro National Park and uh, it's just beautiful because the porters are so well looked after. It's actually, you know, uh, a very stable job uh, so long as the tourism is, is ongoing, which obviously at the moment it isn't, which is very sad to, to see. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're looked after in a sense that, you know, they're not allowed to carry more than, I think it's 10, is it five kilograms? Plus their own stuff. Um, so then there's, there's a lot of rights and respect for these people now um, compared to what they used to be anyway, which is just brilliant. So you know that, and they're just so happy they're such happy people they're very fit very strong very well adapted to life on the mountain so the porters were in the bus we're chatting to them a rickety old road driving along and basically we drove to the start of the route that we were going to take which was the wrong guy route so the wrong guy route goes up the uh, sort of northern side it's probably one of the quieter trails that people use so on kilimanjaro there are five different routes so there's the wrong guy route the mwenzi route the Mwe Mweka route, the Umbwe route, the Machame route, and the Lamosho route. So the Machame is probably one of the most popular, and the Lamosho is the longest route. So the Rongai route itself actually took us six days to get up and down. You can do it slightly shorter, but the key with all of these uh, routes is essentially uh, pole pole, which means slowly, slowly, because you are going into sort of, um, you know, the, the, the altitude where you can start to get altitude sickness, the slower you can go, the more likely you are to acclimatize. And there's other things you can do as well. Um, you know, just so, so staying hydrated, like so hydrated, everything we were eating was like super liquidy. Um, and, uh, you know, just going nice and slowly, making sure you're trying to sleep as well as you can, and possibly even taking Diamox, which is an altitude sickness medication. Now there's a lot of studies into whether it works or whether it doesn't, because who can get altitude sickness? Again, there's no like set uh, pattern. Uh, young people can get it, older people can get it, um, fit people can get it, unfit fit people can get it. Pretty much anybody and everybody can be susceptible to altitude sickness. Um, so it's just basically being on the case and looking after yourself as much as possible that can really help to prevent you from getting it. So I've got here uh, the book that I took up the mountains. It's jolly thick. Uh, it's a trailblazer guide, big fan of trailblazer. It's Kilimanjaro, the trekking guide to Africa's highest mountain. And uh, I just wanted to run through the different stages that we took to get up the mountain. I can't remember off the top of my head all the different campsites we stayed at. So the route started at Rongai Gate. And I remember um, it was really nice because there was just some women walking around, you know, carrying uh, baskets of food, potatoes, I think it was, on their heads. And they were super friendly and just like cheered us on as we went. And that was, that was beautiful. The porters sort of marched off into the distance straight away. And uh, we literally sort of started walking through the cloud rainforest. So uh, cloud rainforest covers much of the northern slopes because it's quite humid, it's quite wet and damp. Um, it's, a, it's a really amazing habitat. And I remember, I can't remember if it was blue monkeys or colobus monkeys that we saw, but we saw some monkeys uh, quite soon into our trek, which was super cool. So we were watching them for a bit. Um, we also saw some uh, malachite sunbirds, which was amazing. And actually what I loved about being with these three guys, the, Ian, the two Ians and Andy, um, and of course our guide, um, Exxon and Ruben, is so knowledgeable about the, the wildlife and um, of course I was there because I was passionate, as passionate about wildlife as I was uh, about mountains and, and everything else. So we were looking at all the flowers all the way up, we were looking at the birds. Uh, Ian Redmond, Ian R, brought his camera trap so we set that up every night to see what wildlife we could see. Uh, and it was just, it was so nice and, and actually <laughs> for anyone who's interested in plants, you know that you don't tend to make fast progress when you're looking at plants. So that really helped with uh, acclimatization, pole pole, slowly, slowly. Um, and of course, along the way, we were still getting to know each other as well, which was, which was awesome. 
So the first day basically took us up to Simba campsite, which I think is called First Cave Campsite now. Uh, so we walked through the cloud rainforests. Um, we got to a point where we could see over the plains of Tanzania, which was just amazing to think about, you know, the, the tribal people down there and the wildlife and the just big open space. And especially how, you know, even just a hundred years before it would have been so much more untouched and untamed. And uh, just being able to let my imagination go with that was, was really amazing. Um, but of course we were still just adjusting to life on the mountain, adjusting to the pace, which sometimes is painfully slowly, but the path is really well marked. Uh, we had lots of things to talk about and <laughs> I was also spending a lot of the day just, just trying to calm down my anxiety. Uh, at this point I was nowhere near as aware, aware of my mental health as I am now. I certainly couldn't converse about it as I can now either. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, I'm obviously in the project as the filmmaker. Okay. And on the bus, uh, the coach thing, bussy thing, on the way to Rongai Gate to the start of the walk, I was filling up, you know how you have a camel back, a camel bladder thing that slits in your rucksack and you got the tube? So my camera was on the floor, uh, my main DSLR camera, which I wanted to be doing on the filming on, similar to what I am now, this is different though. Um, <laughs> so I'm filling up the camel bladder with water and I didn't realize that the hose wasn't shut So I completely watered like showered my camera and it didn't even work So we got to the mountain and I <laughs> was just like, oh no So we had to do most of the filming on GoPros and these are quite old GoPros. They're GoPro 3 3 plus silver it was um, so they were pretty current at the time, but um, as you can imagine nowhere near as good quality as a DSLR and I was just I was like, this is just ridiculous. Like we tried to joke about it, but the truth was, I reckon, I mean, if I was in their shoes, Ian, the Ian's and Andy's shoes, I would be like, what have we done? Bring, bringing this like incompetent 18 year old <laughs> to come and film on Kilimanjaro. Uh, so I really had to just work through the process of forgiving myself for that. And actually to be fair, you know, I shoot a lot of stuff on GoPros now. So it was a good opportunity for me to sort of work on that. Um, and it, it turned out to be okay. <laughs> Uh, so back onto the trail, so we're walking up to Simba campsite, uh, sort of in and out of the cloud. Every single day on the trail, the cloud would be quite low, so it'd be quite misty and, and it was never too cold. Uh, but the blessing with the Rongo route is that the mountain gets significantly less moisture than the southern slopes. So actually we were much less likely to encounter rain than some of the other trekkers on the mountains. Um, and like, yes, you know, it was often cloudy, but it didn't tend to take, it didn't take very long for the cloud, the mist to dissipate, uh, to burn off. And then we'd be in sunshine for, for the rest of the day and the evening. So that was really cool. Uh, so walking, 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 uh, seeing all the different things we saw on the route, lots of different flowers, um, some random like <laughs> holes in the ground. We had a bit of fun with as well. And just basically there's no rush. You just settle into the steady life. Um, or steady pace of life on the trail. So we get to Simba campsite, so our first campsite, the porters are already there. There's just a little shack thing um, that's set up and tents are all pitched up as well. So Ian and Ian were sharing, Andy was in his own tent and I was in my own tent. Um, so there's different tour, there's, there's hundreds of different tour operators that, that take people up and down Kilimanjaro. You, you, you can't go up and down Kilimanjaro on your own. You have to be with a certified guide. It's within the national park. You have to pay for all the permits and access. Um, you have to sign at most campsites to make so that there's a log. People know where you are and when you've got there. Um, so it's all strictly monitored just to, again, to help preserve and conserve the mountain uh, from heavy footfall and uh, erosion and things like that as well, keeping people safe in the national park. Uh, so yeah, we get to the campsite. There's a, we basically every day we've got the camp is set up. So we've got the mess tent, um, which is like a table and chairs, and we would just be fed such beautiful food. But of course it's all designed high carbohydrate, super, super liquidy to fuel us on. So we'd eat things like, um, I don't know, in the morning it was always like super sloshy porridge. Uh, we'd have fruit. They'd always give us like in the evening, massive bowls of pasta or rice uh, with sweet corn and couscous. Uh, it, but literally it would be like a, a platter in the middle and it's just heaped with food. So we'd eat everything we could. And like, I really remember just trying to force food down, especially higher up. Uh, but you know, it was just trying to keep our bodies fueled and keep them hydrated was always the priority. And then there was the, um, the kitchen tent where the cook would be working every day and he was the legend of a guy, so funny. And the porters would just sort of uh, come and go and they were lovely. 
and there was a, a chap i can't remember what his name was which just sucks i know i've got it written down in my diary he was quite a young chap he must have been like 20 uh, and he was sort of the i don't know head porter but he was so friendly and his english was really really good and i remember having some super chats with him uh certainly higher up the mountain um we were we had a bit of a friendship going on afterwards which was so nice uh so yeah that was that and then um had a sleep which was cool and i remember that first night <laughs> ian singleton was sick uh which was i was thankful not to be in that tent um he, he was already getting at, at well we think it was actually food poisoning uh, because altitude didn't seem to affect him too much so that was that not from the cooking but from the flight over as well so yeah and the next morning off we go again so we're on to the next day and we're going up to second cave campsite uh, so again sort of walking in the mist initially um, and then it burns off and it's all rather nice and lovely uh, just trekking up I don't I don't I can't quite remember all the individual things that happened every single day especially because I was so focused on trying to film and what I found was because I was always filming and it was still quite new to me I wasn't quite looking after myself I wasn't drinking as much as I should have done um, and I think that's why later on as we'll get to I got really affected by altitude uh, so that was the second day up to second cave campsite seeing the things along the way there the third day then took us up to Kikalewa campsite. Um, I remember that being quite a cool campsite. We had some, I think it was there, that we had an epic sunrise. Actually, to be honest with you, I get a little bit confused. I can't quite remember our itinerary. I think Second Cave was a lunch stop and then we went through to Kikalewa campsite. So we stayed there for the next night. Um, and then the next day after that was a shorter day because we went up to Mwenzi Tarn, which was super cool and was more on that later. But just those stretch, I remember that stretch being a little bit of a blur uh, because it was often quite misty. Um, <laughs> at one point, Ian Redmond, we'd walked for, I don't know, a good three hours and then he remembers that he'd left his camera trap at <laughs> uh, the campsite that we were just at. So we had to run back down the mountain with Andy and then they came back up, which was quite funny. Um, I think that was actually when we were going up to Mwenzi Tarn because I remember walking up to Tarn and then being like bye <laughs> so that was funny uh, but yeah essentially like obviously at the time it was a very real experience I remember like physically I felt absolutely fine my body felt strong there was nothing challenging about the experience we were going through of course we didn't have much weight on our back either just at, just day packs essentially um, we were stopping lots to film stopping lots to eat and drink um, but once we got to Mwenzi Tarn, I remember feeling not so good. <laughs> so I tried to eat food that evening. We met and chatted to some, uh, some really cool people who were at the different camps there as well. Because as you're going, like you do see other hikers and other trekkers. Uh, it tends to be less so actually on the trail, I found. I don't know if Killy is much busier now. Uh, but at the campsites, there's you know often other people and stuff. And... I'm not the best mingler anyway, um, but that night, Mwenzi Tarn, I was not feeling good. So basically I went to bed with a th just throbbing headache and I remember being like, it literally feels like an elephant has sat on my head. Um, and I woke up in the night like convinced I was just going to vomit everywhere. Um, really, really, really dizzy, like trying my best not to pass out. And I remember sort of shouting out to Ian Redmond who came in and basically like slept in the tent with me. Um, and just like offered reassurance because I was not in a good state and for some reason my body if ever like it feels threatened like I just go into like pass out mode and so which is just that was my first real experience of that and being dizzy and passing out is just not a fun experience so that was very clearly altitude sickness uh, and I was you know just trying to keep the vomit in as much as possible uh, try and drink some fluids and just get through the night it was a rough night and of course at night it would get quite cold um, because you know you're getting higher up as well so trying to just stay warmer so shivery uh, we got through the night I remember that morning being quite a victorious morning uh, sort of seeing everybody and explaining what happens and they sort of encouraged me on which was amazing really good sort of friendship team thing going on there and uh, definitely felt a lot better come the morning
town itself is actually uh, situated beneath uh, Mwenzi Peak so it's sort of a really jaggedy uh, <laughs> like mountain uh, above us uh, obviously well I, I haven't even mentioned Kilimanjaro is a, an, it's, it's an extinct well a dormant volcano uh, so you know it's very ashy it's very sooty it's very dry as you're going up and Mwenzi is this like co compared to Kili which is like this dome Mwenzi is like these jagged teeth. It's quite surreal actually. And you know, we see it in and out of the cloud, even more so than Kili coming up the wrong guy route. Um, so that was really cool. It was a spectacular campsite, I must admit. Uh, so the next morning, wake up, get some food in us, get some fruit down, get some porridge down and off we go. And that was, this day is the day I rem remember the most because you know, we headed up um, through the mist as usual. <laughs> uh, we could see all the like, d again, looking at all the different plants, the red hot pokers, the um, you know almost like cactus like plants that were growing around and we reached the saddle which is this big almost desert like plain with just this path stretching along it up to Kibo huts and it was there that we came across um, some the wreckage of an old plain so the saddle was quite windy it was really really exposed uh, the ashy sandy stuff would blow up in our faces uh, we, we actually saw our first Lamagaya there as well, which are these massive birds that uh, live on the mountains and around the mountains. Um, and it was a pretty surreal experience actually, just, you know, there being hardly any flora about, uh, what with the broken pieces of metal and plane shattered everywhere as well. Um, but I was really struggling with altitude again. The higher we climbed, the more my head would pound, the more nauseous I would get, the more dizzy I would get. Uh, and yet at the same time, I was just wanted to fall on my knees and weep with the the sense of achievement that I was gaining every single day. Uh, it was such, such, such slow progress, but we finally made it to um, Kibo Huts. And that's where we joined the Morango route, which would be the route we would take down the mountain. So they joined us as well. It's like a conversion point at Kibo Huts. So we had to sign the register. Uh, there's a super cool, like, um, Kilimanjaro sign there as well. And it's basically from Kibo Huts that you push up to the summit. So. I pretty much just collapsed in the tent and fell asleep <laughs> uh, had some food fell asleep and then at 11 p.m we were woken up and that was when we were due to start our um our climb up the mountain so we were going to climb through the night uh, and summit for sunrise essentially that was the goal and of course a lot of other people had the same idea there's just a stream of headlights going up the mountain i remember sort of starting off it's just so 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 cold the water in my bottles were frozen and you use uh, especially in colder places you tend to use bottles with like a wider rim because it means you know they're going to freeze a lot slower and you'd also keep it stuffed down your jumper uh, my memories of that night are quite hazy because i was so unwell um but basically I remember just being really dizzy. I remember at some point my pack was taken off me and my shoulders were held to steer me in the right direction because essentially we were climbing up a really steep ashy slope, uh, which of course in the dark you can't see. All you can see is the stars above you and the headlights of the people above you as well. And you're just going one foot in front of the other step by step, super slowly and it's so cold and you're not even thinking straight. Uh, you're just focusing on one foot after the other and just breathing because you know you're breathing you're getting a lot less oxygen taken in uh, or your body's meta you know using 
not quite able to access the same amount of oxygen so breathing is very labored and very hard uh, and then gradually we climbed higher and we reached I think it's called Gilman's Point um, where you know there's a sign saying congratulations you at Gilman's Point and then you keep going <laughs> and by now you know the sun is just starting to come up and we round the sort of the rim and before then we're finally 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 cutting up onto the crater and you can see the glaciers you can see the sun sort of peeking over the horizon you can see the clouds below you and oh my flipping goodness it is the most surreal experience like one of the best experiences i've ever had um even though i don't really quite completely remember it anymore because i was just so unwell but we got to the top the sun's coming up everybody's like crying uh everyone touches the plaque we take our photos do our bits to the camera we don't hang around because it is very 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 cold it was also quite windy um but it was just the most amazing amazing experience to reach the top of kilimanjaro the highest freestanding mountain in the world I can't even express how happy I am. This place is amazing. And the glacier is just so... Wow. And you can see Mount Meru. And we've seen the sunrise. I mean, speechless with joy. So that was that, we made it to the top, just looking out over the volcano, over the glaciers, trying to breathe it all in, take it in, take some picture memories in our minds, and then it was to turn back down. And actually every step I started to take down, I would feel better, I would feel stronger. Um, the <laughs> Going down was easy, because rather than switch back, we would literally just go straight down the ash slope, and we called it like, um, like ash skiing, or what do we call it? Yeah, like ash skiing. It was so much fun. You just take a step and sink, take a step and sink. So you had to be really quick. And we just ran down the mountain back to Cuba Huts, and uh, the porters were there, and it was like hugs all round and super happy and so good. And we had some food, and we had a rest, and we had a nice cold drink, and we packed everything up, and then we headed down to Harombo Huts. So our return route uh, was via the Morangu route and it's just so quick going down the mountain is so 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 quick uh Killian Journey, who's a um uh is, it, is he italian an italian ultra runner he ran up the mountain in six hours so in terms of distance and <laughs> challenge it's not difficult uh but of course you just go slowly to work for altitude sickness uh but going down you don't need to think about that you just go down so we sort of ran down um to harumbo hut sort of taking in seeing the landscape change again as we get close you know as more plant life can start to flourish um harumbo huts was a very very busy place i remember just sort of keeping myself to myself there because there was there was a lot of huts um people going up the morangu route you sleep in huts usually uh and there were huts at kibo huts as well hence why it's called huts <laughs> but they were for only for people uh doing the morango route so we stayed there for a night uh nice sort of sunrise again and then the next day it was right back down to the beginning uh so we we kept going down, uh, seeing all the different wildlife. Um, again, we entered into the cloud rainforest and saw some monkeys. I think those were the blue monkeys that we saw. Um, seeing all the different plants again, flora was it was just it was just all amazing. There's so much to take in, so much to stimulate your senses. Um, we made it to the bottom. <laughs> um had the most epic wonderful celebration with songs that i still sing memories that i think of almost every day that bring smiles to my face and uh just the the greatest sense of achievement i have ever felt i think just one of the proudest moments of my life um having made it up and back down kilimanjaro <laughs> Okay. 
So that brings us to the end of our, our video today. Um, so I just, as I say, I've talked a lot. I just, a lot of different things covered there. Absolutely there's things I've missed out that I probably wanted to say, but I'm just going to run with this and I hope it's been uh, nice for you guys just to sit and listen and to see some footage from Kilimanjaro in 2014. I hope it's inspired you to sort of think outside the box and to think about what challenges and dreams you'd like to undertake. Um, I'm a big believer that we have dreams uh, that, that basically we're okay to just dream for the rest of our life and then there's dreams that we need to manifest and we need to live out and Kilimanjaro for me and still is a dream that I needed to live out I lived out and I want to live out again uh, it's not one I'm happy just to sort of keep in the cupboard and and just dream about for the rest of my life um, Kilimanjaro changed my life and I know it will change my life again so thank you for sharing this time with me uh, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation and uh, as I say I hope you've been inspired as well so guys, uh, any questions you've got about every, anything, please pop it in the comments below. As always, please keep it kind because this is a safe space for people. Uh, we're all about inspiring and empowering people to get outside from mental and physical health whilst building meaningful connections with the natural world and with each other. So keep it kind, keep it considerate. Uh, let's encourage each other on, let's support each other uh, to achieve our goals and let's make a difference in this world because we're not just living for ourselves, we're living for others as well. All right, guys, that's all from me. Take care and stay wild. I will see you on the trail pretty soon. Adiós. <laughs>